Now, petrol and diesel are essential commodities. Recently, the federal government introduced the Goods and Services Tax, or GST, but, but uh, fuels do not fall under GST, whose highest rate is 28%. Taxes on fuel are more than 50%. Now, these taxes go to both the federal and provincial governments. The federal government uh, can consider bringing fuel under the GST. It will be a big relief for consumers. The provincial governments, for their part, can lower the taxes too. Number two, futures contracts. Now, the Indian government has already cleared the proposal for oil futures contracts. Retailers and consumers can agree to buy when fuel is cheap. The price they will be charged will not change at the time of taking delivery. But regulatory body SEBI is yet to give its nod to the proposal. Then there is differential pricing. Why should a consumer driving a luxury car buy fuel for the same price at which it is sold to a common man who uses a 100cc motorcycle? Differential pricing can be introduced to subsidize poor consumers while the rich can be charged market prices. Now the opposition Congress party today called for an India shutdown. Some other opposition parties also supported the call. There were reports of vandalism from some parts which is condemnable. Protests should be peaceful. But the federal government can also not continue to ignore the plight of Indians. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has appreciated people who voluntarily gave up subsidies on gas cylinders. He has appreciated Indians who are tax compliant. It is time the government reciprocated the goodwill and tried to stem skyrocketing fuel prices. All right, moving on. If you live in Italy and love shopping on weekends, then that is about to stop very soon. The new Italian government will introduce a ban on Sunday shopping in large commercial centers by the end of this year. The reason? The Italian government feels that shopping on weekends is destroying family traditions and creating distance among family members. Deputy Prime Minister Luigi Di Mao said, and I quote, this liberalization is in fact destroying Italian families. We need to start limiting opening and closing times again, unquote. Now, larger stores have been ordered to close on national holidays as well. This comes as a big U-turn by the Italian government. In 2012, Monti had liberalized Sunday trading in a bid to spur economic growth. This in spite of pressure from the Roman Catholic Church and unions to mark Sunday as a traditional rest day. Now, small shopkeepers in Italy have been for long rooting to overturn Monti's 2012 reform, saying that their businesses face unfair competition from big malls. And not just Italy, earlier this year, Poland restricted Sunday shopping as the conservative uh, government in Warsaw pushed ahead with what it said was a return to Roman Catholic values. Poland was one of those nations that was free to shop on any day of the week. Now, Sunday shopping became a popular family pastime in Poland with the advent of the free market after the collapse of communism in the year 1989. Then a legal amendment introduced a gradual Sunday trading ban from March 2018. The law was proposed by the ruling Law and Justice Party in support of the Solidarity Trade Union, which was skeptical about the lack of a clearly defined day off in the Polish labor law. Religion was also a big factor as Poland is a predominantly Christian country with 92% of citizens declaring their faith as Catholic. Church officials supported the ban. According to Catholic teachings, Sunday should be a day free from unnecessary professional obligations. Now, Aleppo in Syria witnessed a fierce battle. After years of war, it has now mostly been freed of terrorists and rebel militia. The challenge now is to accommodate the people who are returning to the town. Take a look at this exclusive report sent by Vyond's Karthike Sharma. Reconstruction work has started in Aleppo. Over 50 to 70 percent of Aleppo was destroyed in the war. So you can see the buildings which were destroyed 
when the terrorists were here, they were taken under their control, the mortar fire, the artillery fire, the whole complex was completely destroyed. No, this is the destroyed complex, but that is past and that past is being changed by people. So we are in this uh, suburb of Aleppo, which was completely overrun by the terrorists. But now what is happening is that new buildings are being built. And this is happening despite the fact that, you know, even the shelling takes place in adjoining areas because the city has been cleared, but there are parts which are 20 to 30 kilometers away, which are still under the rebel control. But at least for those who want to stay in Aleppo, it can be a good life. So the new apartments are being built. You know, people have started coming here. These are residential areas. Look at them. These, some of them must be a three bedroom flat. So all these apartments are being built for the people to come back. Aleppo had a population of uh, roughly 40 lakh people. 20 lakh people went away. Only 5 lakh people have come back. So, you know, Aleppo will need to accommodate a 15 lakh more people. So, you know, this is a beautiful sound of uh, men working on machine and it tells you that the city is coming back to life. So this is not a sound which irritates me today. It's a sound which makes me happy because it's a sound of rebuilding, cutting of the stones, you know, ensuring that these, uh, uh, this uh, housing complex is built. It's a big housing complex which they are building. Uh, look, at the, look at the way systematically they are going around. Uh, most of these complex will be given to those who lost their houses. Uh, and this is, this is part and parcel of the reconstruction project uh, which the government is involved in. So I would say that this is good part of Aleppo story where we talk about reconstruction. You can see the holes in the wall, motors, but the, on the other hand, you can see the newly, freshly built houses for the people of Aleppo. So that's the story of Aleppo where the old one which was completely destroyed, the new buildings are coming so that the people can come back. And this is despite the fact that there are outskirts out there which are still occupied by rebels and we can still hear the softening of the targets. With camera person Manish Shrivastav, Kartike Sharma from one of the suburbs of Aleppo for We On. We began with this project since one year. This place was destroyed by terrorists. It will allow the people to come back without paying much money. The purchase would be subsidized by the government. The government has just finished the construction work. This building project is important. It will be handed over to the people. All right, moving on. Former U.S. President Barack Obama is on the campaign trail again. While speaking at a Democratic congressional rally, Obama revealed that he was kicked out of Disneyland. Listen in to find out why. I just want to mention, I, I, was, I was telling them that uh, I went to Disneyland twice when I was <laughs> younger. Uh, the first time was when I was 11 years old. Now, now, there is no better time to go to Disneyland than when you're 11 years old. And uh, I, I, I lived in Hawaii, so this was my first big trip to the mainland. And uh, I was with my grandmother, who at that point her health was starting to fail a little bit and uh, her eyesight was starting to go. Uh, I was with my mom and I was with my baby sister who was two years old. And we traveled from Seattle all the way down to Anaheim and then cut across to Arizona and looped up. It, 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 uh, it, it was an amazing trip. Went to Yellowstone. Um, but Disneyland was the highlight. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 and, uh, you know, I, I, I went and, and did all the you know, bare necessity thing and the, you know, the uh, small world, you know, the matter, I mean, it was, it was, it was the bomb. <laughs> Second time, I was in college, uh, and I was going to Occidental College, uh, up uh, between Eagle Rock and, and Pasadena, and uh, we came down here not to go to the Matterhorn or uh, to do Pirates of the Caribbean, but to see Cool in the game. So I'm dating myself a little bit here. Those of you who were not born yet when Cool in the Gang was popular, you should go check it out. 
Um, so we came down, me and a bunch of friends. After the concert, because we were teenagers, we, uh, you could still kind of hang out in the park, and so we went into the, the gondolas. And, and, I, and I'm ashamed to say this, so close your ears, young people, but uh, a few of us were smoking <laughs> on the gondolas. Well, no, no, these, these were cigarettes, people. <laughs> Terrible thing. Uh, I, I, they do, they kill you, I stop. But at the time, I'm a teenager, I'm rebellious. Uh, as we're coming in, there are these two very large uh, Disneyland police officers. And they say, sir, uh, can you come with us? And they escorted us out of Disneyland. This is a true story, everybody. Um, you know, I was booted from the Magic Kingdom. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know what I remember about it was at the end, they said, uh, uh, you're going to have to leave, sir, for breaking uh, the rules of the Magic Kingdom, but you are welcome to come back anytime. <laughs> Which I thought, well, that was nice of them. Uh, anyway, those are my memories of Disneyland. I was ex I'll just give you a little context for my appearance here today. Um, I do, I love you too. <laughs> 